So uh, I've been working on Plan S, as many of you have. Uh, and part of what I do is in my work is arrange to have uh, small groups of people talk about Plan S. And uh, so recently, uh, uh, in uh, DC at the publishers meeting and at SSP uh, at a, uh, a, a, a concurrent session and now uh, here in London, we've had groups of people each talking about what their organization is doing on this. Uh, <clears throat> the presentations uh, from the, uh, the DC session are at the URL here. Um, the SSP session was, was very, very good, uh, but SSP does not, they have an embargo period apparently. Who knew? Uh, they uh, don't post the slides uh, until about 30 to 60 days after the session, uh, but they also do have the uh, audio uh, with them. Uh, if you would like to have uh, the slides from any of the speakers at, who are at SSP, just go ahead and write me, sac at stanford.edu, sac at highwire.org, uh, and I will, uh, I have the slide decks. I don't have the audio, but I have the slide decks, and I'll give them to you. Uh, and the, uh, the London session uh, today, the speakers' uh, slide decks are at this URL. <clears throat> so, I'm going to do uh, just a bit of introduction about the process that we at Highwire have been following. Uh, and this is sort of a timeline uh, uh, giving you some of the information about, uh, uh, I conducted a series of interviews in early October last year uh, to try and identify common themes uh, among uh, 15 publishing organizations that I talked with. Uh, then the implementation guidance came out in uh, November. Uh, then I did a survey of publishers in December. We did a workshop uh, with about 40 people, uh, 40 to 50 people. Uh, at the end of January, we did a survey then. Uh, and then uh, uh, to, to, the survey was to identify what the top options were that people were considering. Uh, and then oh, just recently uh, in May, uh, we did another survey. And I'll give you some information about how all that has uh, uh, turned out. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so uh, from the very initial set of conversations that I had back in October, uh, there were about 14 different options people were looking at. These are options that came up two or three or four or more times uh, from people. And they were not mutually exclusive. You could pick multiple options. But then what we did next, <clears throat> uh, as I said, there, that uh, I then did a survey after the workshop that we held uh, at the end of January. So this, the, the first, let's go back a bit. So this was pre-guidance. In other words, the, the guidance that came out at the, in November had not yet been published. Then the guidance came out, and then we held a workshop for 40 publishers at the end of uh, January, and uh, using the same 14 options, but there were three options that, <clears throat> excuse me, were uh, at the top. And those are the three on the, on the bottom here. And then there was one that I found particularly interesting and wanted to call out separately. Uh, and that was the, uh, well, it was a, the option that uh, at the time we called just say no. Uh, but uh, we wanted to be a little more polite now and, and just call it stay the course for now. The reason I wanted to highlight that option uh, is that it rose most significantly in the rankings from pre-guidance to the workshop. Uh, there are two scores under each of the, uh, in each of the boxes. One is the pre-guidance score, the other is the post-workshop score. So you can just see which things moved up or down and which ones moved up or down significantly. But let me summarize all that for you. <clears throat> now this looks a little complicated, but I'm gonna simplify it. Uh, these are the 14 options. 
And the box at the top, the purple box at the top is interesting, and the stuff at the bottom is interesting, but for two entirely different reasons. Basically, the top four options are consistent in all the surveys. Now, I've talked with you folks for you know six or more months about this, and it doesn't feel consistent, and yet when I graphed it, yep, it's pretty consistent. What you were considering, your, your most favored options, uh, has been consistent over months. <clears throat> so that's the purple. And you notice that um, the top option, use green OA to comply, basically has been number one all along. That was a surprise to me to see that. Uh, now at the bottom with the, the red and the green, here's how to read this. Uh, what I did was uh, circle the options that moved up or down the most. If it moved down, it's in red. If it moved up, it's in green. Uh, and so you can see that read and publish is kind of interesting because it bounced. Uh, so we, one of the things we're going to talk about a bit more is is read and publish because it's it's bouncing probably for some really good reasons. Um, the just say no option, which as I mentioned, has is now called stay the course for now, uh, was you know basically people didn't even seriously consider it uh, back before the guidance, and uh, then it moved up considerably. Um, the idea of using preprints to comply moved up considerably. But now with the new guidance, it, it, my guess is it would probably move back down. Um, and uh, transformative agreements uh, uh, moved uh, from 7 to 11 uh, in the uh, most recent uh, survey. And I think read and publish and transformative agreements are moving around in part because people are finding them very complicated. And that's, I hope, what Alicia will uh, at least partially unconfuse us about, or she'll convince us that we're confused for a good reason. So before we uh, do dive in with the panelists, um, uh, let's just review uh, that there are essentially three approaches to compliance. The, uh, uh, this comes right out of, this is the November guidance. They have revised this chart uh, in the most recent guidance, but it's essentially the same three paths. Uh, there's a, uh, a path on the left that's about journals. Uh, and you, so basically, as an author, you can publish in an OA journal. Uh, and you can publish in a journal that is under transformative agreements. That's the option on the right. And if the journal you want to publish in isn't one of those options, then you as an author have the option in the middle which is put it in a repository that's compliant. And uh, I think part of the, the challenge uh, is that people have not been focusing on three options. They focus on one or the other. And <clears throat> that middle option turns out to be that's the green OA to comply option that everybody has been favoring all along. Uh, these are the uh, publishers who participated in the surveys and uh, the workshop. I just want to thank them for being um, forthcoming. Uh, I promised everyone anonymity, uh, but obviously the, the panelists uh, are uh, not anonymous. Um, and these are the options that each of the panelists have talked about. Uh, I've only gone through um, the, uh, the, the first six, because uh, today's panelists uh, will be uh, telling you what their preferred options are, or how they're, how they're viewing the, the planning for Plan S. So taking a, a step up, if you will, from the individual options that people are, are uh, looking at. One of the things that I've seen over the last uh, six months is uh, moving from uh, alarm and panic uh, to more a sense of, yep, this is t it's time to just plan. 
Uh, we do planning all the time. We need now to fit Plan S into our planning uh, as opposed to panic. Uh, and uh, one of the other things I've seen is uh, a shift from thinking about how are we going to deal with Plan S to say, thinking how will we incorporate this into the planning we're already doing. In other words, if we have an OA concept, a model, direction, Plan S has to fit in with it. We're not going to change what we do to, to change the world to fit Plan S. Uh, now, in part, this might, you might not have heard that six months ago, because six months ago, no one knew whether Plan S was going to spread to China and India and the US. Uh, and since it hasn't, and frankly doesn't look like it's going to, uh, maybe that's partly why uh, people are now moderating, attenuating their their sense of panic. Uh, another thing that I've seen uh, overall is that uh, people are saying we need to get our governance groups informed before they start telling us what we have to do. Uh, early on, uh, you could you I heard some stories about the society governance groups essentially uh, taking a uh, a quick sense of the of, of a, a publications board and then telling. Uh, the society publishing executive that uh, she had to flip the journals. Uh, and no sense at all of what that would cost, uh, uh, whether it was even possible. Uh, and so I see increasingly that people want to get ahead and provide information uh, into the governance process before that process gets ahead of publishing. Uh, the, the concept of zero embargo green OA seems to be staying uh, strong, and the, the real question is, who's going to carry this out? Is it, are you going to leave it with the authors uh, to figure out uh, whether they need to do it and where to do the deposit, or are you going to take responsibility uh, and do that for the authors? Uh, I see uh, societies uh, in both camps. And then the transformative agreements are still very puzzling for people. So uh, I am uh, working on a detailed um, comparison of the old guidance to the new guidance. I thought this was going to be easy. They didn't actually make it easy because essentially they rewrote it. Uh, I thought they were going to edit it. Uh, but no, it's, it's got a lot that's, that's rewritten. Uh, so I'm hoping maybe in another week I'll have that done. Uh, but, but several people have commented on what the major changes are. Uh, clearly the date uh, is a big deal. Uh, it's only a year out, but uh, more out, but it's still, that's helpful. Um, the rationale document that they published, the rationale for the changes, is actually really good. Uh, I would suggest you read it. It, it pulls stuff up a level, gets you out of the you know, the T's and C's and into a, what are we trying to do and what, what, who did we hear? What did we hear them saying? Um, they've re relaxed the repository requirements. I think that's pretty clear that they have paid attention to uh, institutional repository management. And that may be a real advantage uh, for publishers because you, you can direct your authors to deposit to their institution's repositories as opposed to saying, oh, well, you have to put it in, uh, you know, Euro PMC or something. Um, uh, there is a new uh, uh, option. Uh, it's available only by exception, and that's the ND, no derivative option. Uh, but NC is still not available. Uh, and uh, just uh, skipping on uh, toward the end, uh, there is, at this point, no APC cap. Uh, but they do hold out the possibility there could be one later. Uh, and there seems to be now a requirement, I haven't gotten into the details yet, about uh, transparency of the elements of APC pricing. What that will look like is anyone's guess. Uh, but I hope to have more details for you in about a week. Uh, I recommend these source documents, uh, especially the rationale one. I, I found the Nature and Science articles pretty good. Uh, uh, in, in commenting on this as well. Uh, so that's my introduction. And uh, next, we'll have Claire. Okay. 
So um, that was a really good introduction, and I think it's really interesting to look at the patterns across quite a large number of publishers. Um, but we all know that we're going to have to make our own individual decisions, and that will be based on which subject area we're in, what our current percentage of open access is. And also, I think we're going to see a difference between US and UK publishers. Uh, so, uh, you're going to hear lots of recurring themes in the sessions. I'm going to talk particularly about transformative agreements, society collaborations, and the all-important backup plan. Um, so, this is uh, just a, a reminder that uh, we have uh, five journals. Three of them are hybrid, and two of them are fully open access. <laughs> They're all in the life sciences area. Our two fully open access journals barely break even before overheads and are currently subsidised by our hybrid journals. So the hybrid journals are really important to us financially. Um, and we've obviously been discussing Plan S with our board of directors, um, but I will say that we have not yet made any decisions, so the, the views that I'm putting forward are not 100% uh, definite at this point. Uh, so I can say that we believe that open access is the direction of travel. Um, our first open access offering was back in 2003, um, but you can see that um, the percentage of open access articles only really started growing over the last six or seven years, um, and um, it differs across the journals depending on their subject area. So each journal had, its, uh, had exactly the same uh, policies about open access, but open access just varies by subject area. So we believe that the hybrid model has been genuinely transformative um, and we believe that the, open ac uh, the percentage of open access reflects the number of funders mandating open access. It's not, nothing that the publishers have done, it's all about what the funders have done. So the question is, what's going to happen um, with the Plan S funders coming, with, and their mandates coming into place? So when we first uh, assessed the percentage of open access uh, in our journals, um, we found that it was very similar to the percentage of the Plan S funders. So our first thought was that they were one and the same thing, that the, you know, the authors coming from Plan S um, funders have already been paying for open access, and we might not see much of a change. That's completely not the case. Those authors have not been paying for open access. And so we believe that, let's say from January 2021, we're going to see quite a big increase in the percentage of open access in our journals as those authors come on board. Um, so even with that increase, we don't believe that we could flip these journals currently. And if you look at the orange bar, one of our journals is very, very far from being considered for a flip. Um, so we're currently focusing on transformative agreements to keep our hybrid journals compliant while the open access grows and we can watch how that works. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, um, the guidance on transformative agreements from Plan S is still a work in progress. Um, but if this approach works, we're assuming that we can be compliant for the period January 2021 to December 2024 um, while monitoring the ongoing shift in open access. So if we are clear that we want to work on transformative agreements, what is standing in our way? Um, so I've outlined five of the key potential blockers and what I think we could do to help move them forwards. Um, so number one, I think the biggest real or at least psychological block is that a fixed date for an open access flip um, is still a requirement for a transformative agreement to be compliant. Um, we don't think that we'll know enough by um, before January 2021 in order to say what that date would be. And we also don't know what happens if we set a date and then we decide to change it later. Do we get penalised? You know, what would actually happen? Um, my second point is that we know that read and publish um, deals take the large publishers years to negotiate. So how can smaller publishers, A, get a place at the table and B, resource these negotiations? Um, and I think there are a couple of potential ways forward through partnerships and collaborations. Um, we've joined a group of like-minded not-for-profit publishers to form the Society Publishers Coalition. I'll mention those again in a moment. Um, and as a bigger group, we have already managed to get conversations with a, a couple of, um, of um, sort of, of the, the coalition's coalition uh, partners, such as uh, Max Planck. Um, and I think it's also um, important, we're going to hear Alicia talk about the SPA Ops initiative, um, which I still can never remember what SPA Ops stands for. Um, but I think that it would be really important to look at some model agreements, and we are hoping that these are going to work for the majority of publishers. 
Um, point three is that it's still unclear to me how many transformative agreements we would need and with whom. So to comply with the UK and welcome um, fund mandates, it looks as though we just need a GISC deal. Um, but it's clear that if we come up with a GIST deal, the, the individual institutes around the UK can opt in and out of that deal with different publishers. So we still might not be compliant with the individual institutions that are sending us articles. Um, and if you're not in those uh, deals, then uh, the funder wouldn't pay the APC for authors from that institute. Um, so, if you multiply that for all the different countries, all the different institutes within the, those funder regions, and it's an enormous challenge. Um, and I think the only solution is um, an alternative route for those authors, and I'll be coming up back to that backup plan in a moment. My fourth point was, I still don't really understand the difference between the three types of transformative agreements included in the implementation guidelines. So there are transformative agreements, transformative model agreements, and transformative journals. And uh, you know we can only continue to engage with the relevant parties on what those mean. Um, I will say that um, the Spar Ops project has really engaged with us, and that we're hoping that's going to help move that forward. But the devil is always in the detail. Um, and my final fifth one is that there are also lots of transaction details to be worked out. So which author comes from which institute? Are they the corresponding author? Are they just one of the authors on a paper? Um, how are they going to pay us without us all drowning in paperwork? And for this one, I think that it's important to have partners such as um, CCC or maybe the uh, OA dashboard um, for support. So in summary, we do feel that the timeline for um, being compliant by January 2021 is still extremely challenging, but we're optimistic about making progress towards transformative agreements. We'd be mad not to have a backup plan, and as uh, John's probably um, suggested there, it would be to allow the author accepted manuscript to be published CCBY um, and placed into a repository. We don't like this option. We really don't like this option at all. Um, I think our main reason is that if we provide this for authors, then there's no incentive for them to pay for gold open access in the journal. And we wonder whether, in fact, these percentages of open access content might go down um, and move us backwards away from a transition to open access. Um, so we, we don't want to do it. We would limit it. We would say that it only was available for those funders that mandate it. Um, but if we can't get transitional agreements in place in time, this would have to be part of our short-term plan, at least. Um, I thought I would just um, put up, you know, we, we've, we definitely did the phase of panicking. Um, we're definitely moving on to a phase where we're trying to do some planning. Um, and I've, I've just put up a, a slide showing some of the things that I think we could all be doing. So one is that we can start explaining the true costs of publishing and where we add value as publishers. Um, the next is to make sure you're not double dipping. Can you ha put hand on heart and say, no, we're not double dipping, and you can actually demonstrate that. Um, we're now going to have to um, make this sort of information um, publicly available. Um, mock up your transparent APCs and make sure that you're happy with them before you have to make them public. Review your waiver policy and make sure that it's compliant. Get your metadata in shape, and that's something that you should really be doing anything anyway. Uh, join DORA if you haven't already. Um, if you're not familiar with DORA, I'm on the st steering committee. I'm very happy to have some conversations with you about that. Um, it's one of the things that's come through uh, more strongly um, from the Coalition S um, funders. Um, and I think it is a, it's a really valuable um, in initiative. Um, and last but definitely not least is to start looking for collaborators and partnerships. So these could be with service providers. They could be other, with other like-minded publishers. Um, so I said I just I just a little plug for the Society Publishers Coalition. Um, we started off as a reasonably small group of largely science, um, technical, medical publishers, but we're expanding quite quickly, and so we're including humanities and social sciences. Um, and it's been really useful as a group to share views. Um, we're having a conference next month where we're inviting lots of societies who aren't members of our of our coalition yet. Um, so that we can gather more views and that we hope that as a group we have more power in negotiations um, and if you want to get in touch with me about that that would also be lovely thank you very much
Thanks, Claire. Um, I'm Theo Bloom, and I'm executive editor of the BMJ, but I'm going to be talking about uh, BMJ's portfolio of 70 journals. I have colleagues in the audience who know more about the portfolio than I do, so <coughs> I may defer to them if you ask me difficult questions. Um, and if you're getting a bit sleepy after lunch, the sort of the TLDR version of my talk is it's complicated. Um, I'm, I'm a medical publisher, so I have to declare my conflicts of interest, but the significant one here is that we've just launched MedArchive, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about that if they want to. Um, so, sorry, I, the screen's not working here, so I have to look behind me periodically. The, the, the BMJ itself, which you may have heard of, is a 150-something-year-old journal, but it's both a journal and a magazine. Um, we're wholly owned by the British Medical Association and its members receive a weekly printed magazine that tells them the news, education, what they need as practicing clinicians. And that is linked to and inextricably you know, part of an online international medical journal. But the vast majority of what the BMJ does is not publishing research. And as a result, for the 20 years that open access has existed, all of the BMJ's research has been open access. Uh, initially it was unpaid, now it's on an APC model. It doesn't cover even the costs of running a research team, so it's entirely subsidised by subscriptions to the rest of the journal. And we have a, a small problem that people in this room may appreciate, it's not a hybrid. <laughs> all the research is open access whether or not anyone pays. The research doesn't go behind a paywall but we don't count as gold OA, we're not in DOAJ because part of our content is available on subscription. So there's one of the complexities of how a journal that actually does comply with Plan S in most ways uh, has somehow ended up outside the envelope. Uh, Wellcome Trust have recognised that and listed us in their FAQs, but you know, trying to get all the funders to recognise and confirm to their researchers that the BMJ is somewhere they can publish is one of those time consuming things. Um, the rest of the BMJ uh, portfolio is slightly more traditional uh, research-based journals, um, but as I said, there are 70 of them, um, some old and venerable, some newer, uh, some of, many of the newer ones open access. So we've been launching primarily open access journals since about 2011, and some of those are... Um, siblings to the uh, to the hybrid journals uh, otherwise. None of our journals excludes open access as a possibility, so they're either hybrid or uh, gold OA. Sorry, I said, as soon as I said it, I knew it wasn't true. We have one or two subscription products that aren't really journals, although they're published out of our journals division. They're not publishing original research, and they are subscription content. Um, so we've had a, a policy for a number of years of encourage, encouraging um, some of the higher profile journals to consider having a companion open access journal in the sort of trickle down transfer, whichever version you want to call those things that we heard about this morning, where the open access journal may have different um, acceptance criteria from the parent. And, and we do see it as more of a sort of parent and child. It's not the mirror journal uh, approach that some people have talked about. With These have different editors in chief. They may have different editorial policies of various kinds, but they are closely linked to each other. Um, and just to talk about that portfolio split um, and its complexity, BMJ wholly owns about a quarter of the journals uh, that come out from BMJ. We co-own about another half with society partners, and we publish on behalf of society partners ones that they wholly own. So in terms of deciding what to do with them, some we can decide on our own, some we can decide with partners, and there are of the order of 50 or so partners we have to discuss these things with. Um, and the open access uh, proportions up top, um, the smaller proportion of the journals are open access and hybrid, but you'll see, given that they only started less than a decade ago, they, they're growing fast. Um, so to talk about that growth a little bit, um, the last few years, 
um, open access articles published are growing much faster than closed access articles published, but the overall volume is increasing. That's not a, that's not a switch, that's about an expansion. Um, most of that open access growth is in the pure OA journals. And in particular, one journal, BMJ Open, which is our plus one, if you will, our mega journal, and has a, you know, a high volume of publishing. So uh, in terms of our open access revenue in total, a rather small proportion of it is from the hybrid journals uh, with individual articles paid, uh, paid for by fee, the vast majority is uh, from the gold journals, but most of the portfolio's output is not open access. So, so as I said, it's complicated and you'll get the impression one size doesn't fit all. We're not going to have one solution that says this is how the whole portfolio is going to, going to behave. So in terms of the sort of 14 options that John's nicely presented, we can rule some out and we're continuing to consider some and different ones for different parts of the portfolio. And our society partners may have different views from us about which are the most favorable ways to go. And um, show me the data there is a sort of plea for the fact that you might think we would know which articles are published by authors <laughs> from Plan S funders and who has funded which paper and who has paid the APC. And it's just not that straightforward. So even knowing what proportion of our output from previous years would be affected by the Plan S changes is, is not completely straightforward for us, let alone working out in any future deals which would be in and out and which you know large consortium is going to take which perspective. So data on all of that is is you know having having good data and as Claire said, good metadata, who is the funder, who is the where, you know, what route is the open access uh, fee coming from is going to be key. Did it move? No. So, um, oh golly, I hope, I hope I haven't done all these as one at a time, but here we go. Um, we, most of these are still, uh, no, I didn't, it's okay, still under consideration. Um, we're, not, we're not launching mirror journals. We don't think preprints are a way to comply with uh, Plan S. Um, we, we do deposit it, it currently to PubMed Central for many of our journals. But in essence, either we're considering this for the whole portfolio or some part of the portfolio is considering every other part, one of those options, um, I think, in, insofar as I understand them. So we're, we're simply not in a position to say this is, this is what's going to apply to all of BMJ's journals. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. You can see down here, but not over there. I've just warned my, my co-speaker. If you need to see your slides, you can okay. look there, which I failed to read. Then I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, I'm not BMJ. I'm Brill. Hello. Um, I was at a, a meeting with Coalition S this morning to get some further clarification on the revised guidelines. Um, and of course, I've sent these slides uh, before I was at the meeting. So I'm trying to figure out in my head how I'm going to do that to make it uh, sound sensible also to you. This is our company logo. Uh, what it tells you is that we are extremely old. We are more than 300 years old. Humanities publisher. We are not a society and not a society publisher. Um, we publish uh, books uh, and journals, uh, reference works, bibliographies, primary sources, all content you can imagine that a humanities and social sciences scholar wants. Um, we do this um, as a publicly listed company, so we are a commercial publisher uh, and have been publicly listed for many years. That's also one of the reasons uh, why uh, we can be very transparent with our revenues, with our EBITDA margin, which has been uh, far from 40%, but between 10 and 15%. Uh, we have about 170 staff in five locations. And yeah, that's the number of, of books and uh, journals we are publishing um, uh, every, every year. 
not 160 new databases, but 160 databases which we are updating and, and which we keep uh, on running. We have um, been always a publisher who is very digitally minded. Uh, I think one of the humanities publishers, uh, for a humanities publisher, that's, that's, that's a, sp a special thing, something that um, we're, we're also quite proud of. That was also one of the reasons why we are, were one of the first humanities publishers with a, with a fully serviced open access program. Our open access program is, is 10 years old now. We started it in 2009. Um, basically, we publish everything in open access that can be published in open access. Some 20 full open access journals are in our portfolio out of the 320. Um, we have published more than 300 full open access books, uh, all with a sustainable open access fee, and we've even published um, uh, uh, reference works in open access. And of course, all our journals are, are hybrid. Um, if you look at the, uh, at the figures, yeah, that's what I've just said. It's, it's even a bit more open access books. If you look at the figures of the percentage of open access, 8% of uh, articles in open access, that's total, that's the full open access articles as well as the, the hybrid ones. Um, then 4% of our open access, uh, of our books of our open access, of the, of the book front list. Um, but a, less, uh, a bit less than 2% of our revenue. So as you can see, uh, although we have been, um, yeah, we've experimented quite a lot with open access, uh, we've been, part of Knowledge Unlatched, we have flipped journals from subscription to full open access, um, done a lot in, in, in the diamond open access space, and although we have done that, um, on the one hand, we are lagging substantially behind um, the, the, the figures that you have just seen from um, SDM publishers. Um, in, in general, one would say between 20 and 30 percent of all articles that are published these days are open access. But on the other hand, there is also a, a misbalance between the output and, and the revenue we are making. So something that we are very concerned about. I knew before Plan S was coming along that uh, in the humanities and social sciences, in order to catch up with STM, which I think is really important because research we publish is super relevant and needs to be just as visible as STM research, in order to catch up with that, we really need a plan. We need a plan that is uh, suitable for our needs, uh, for our for the fields we are publishing in, which are uh, not as funded as STM. There are not as many grants given to uh, humanities publishers. We need a plan that works for that community. Uh, yeah, we then of course uh, got Plan S. Uh, that that's what we what we received, um, and. Yeah, from the very beginning, I think we all, uh, not just at Brill, but we all sensed that this is something very serious, um, that the plans that were proposed in the very beginning, more than a year ago, were, were rather radical. Um, and we all had to get used to uh, this new world where there was a real strong impetus from uh, funders and other organizations to really accelerate uh, open access. We um, at Rural have tried to engage in that conversation from the very start uh, with Coalition S. Um, we have also tried to do that, like the society publishers, in, uh, um, yeah, in collaboration with other, with other publishers, with other small and medium-sized publishers, I have to say, because uh, the, the challenges we as small and medium-sized publishers, particularly in the humanities, face are different to those of societies and are certainly different to those of the big STM publishers. So we felt it was important to come together, uh, have conversations with Coalition S, um, and I have to say uh, those conversations from the very start, very beginning, and we've had several in the last one this morning, were always uh, very open, um, uh, very respectful, uh, and, and also always um, uh, it was very clear that the people on the other side had one uh, aim, and, and, and that was a shared goal, to accelerate open access in the fields we are publishing in. Um, and there was really, from my perspective, an understanding of the challenges we are facing. So what's, uh, what's plan, plan B, plan uh, Brill for us? 
Um, for us, green open access is the worst possible option. It was put on number one. For me, it is, it's also number one here, but not because I like it, but because it's, for me, the worst uh, uh, possible option. That was my, my fear from the very beginning, that uh, green open access would be all that's left for the humanities and social sciences. And as Claire has said, it would actually mean that uh, we, we would take a step, we, we, we would move back, uh, we would get less open. Uh, yes, it would be green open access, but those articles that in the past have been hybrid open access would now disappear in repositories instead of showing the full impact in the surrounding of their journal. So this is the, the, my least favorable option, but it is a quick fix. It is an intermediate solution, um, and it is for us at Brill acceptable to adjust our green open access policy um, if there is a real commitment from all stakeholders uh, to move to a fully gold open access future. Um, that's also why we think um, it is tremendously important that Coalition S is supportive of, mo of any models that help shift money that is currently uh, in subscriptions to open access. Uh, a key role, of course, in that uh, entire game, um, uh, a key role up, uh, are, uh, that are playing, are the, the, the people that are playing a key role are universities and institutions, because they sit on this money uh, that they are currently paying to us in subscriptions. Uh, consortia. Um, and that's also the reason why uh, we felt it was imp really important to, um, to encourage uh, um, consortia, universities, institutions to engage with smaller and medium-sized publishers in uh, negotiations about transformative agreements. Um, and uh, I'm really grateful that Coalition S has also put this really specifically, not just the society publishers, but small and medium-sized publishers in the revised guidelines. That is something that I think we now have something in hand to, to, to put to those uh, parties at the other side and, and, and tell them you need to do something. I mean, in Germany, the deal negotiations, they have very early on said, we're only going to speak to three publishers. Um, uh, this is exactly uh, the approach, um, uh, I think, um, yeah, that, is, that would be extremely difficult and would put us and many others uh, in an extremely difficult situation. I'm still a big fan of hybrid, uh, I think uh, we all are. Uh, for us, hybrid is very similar to the other publishers that have spoken. It's a very small percentage. Um, we publish, uh, um, yeah, uh, you can't even, yeah, it, it's such a small percentage that we, we only very, very rarely have to activate our policies against double dipping. Very, very rarely, because it happens just randomly uh, from one journal to the next. One year we have one, next year we have two open access articles, very randomly. But still, for some journals, I think hybrid will be the only way, only sustainable way for a slow transition to open access. That's why I think uh, conversations about those policies are really important. Whether you call them hybrid or transformative journals, I think uh, that can be discussed, but transformative journals is something that we are also looking at. Um, CC BY is not always the most suitable uh, license for HSS. That's a totally different uh, discussion, but I think it is an important one uh, that our authors are also interested in. And I see a red light. Uh, blinking, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Oh.